You have brought us out here to kill us with hunger. Verse 4, then God said, okay, I'll rain bread from heaven for you. The people will go out and gather a certain rate every day, and I'll prove them whether they walk in my law or not. How did Moses manage to pull that off? He didn't. It had to be God. And verse 6, Moses and Aaron said, at evening, then you'll know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. It wasn't just me who did this. I got another question. If Moses did bring them out, how did he manage to get the Red Sea part? Because they all witnessed that. Now, verse 14. Uh, and when the dew that lay was gone, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And that was manna. And for 40 years, they had manna. Verse 16. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Now, he's saying, God told me this. Gather every man according to his eating and honor for every man. And they were to do it the first, the first six days of the week. And if they gathered too much, it would stink. They could only gather one day a week. And when it came to Friday, then they could gather twice as much. And God did a miracle every seven days by causing the manna that fell on Friday not to stink. And it lasted till, till, they were, till the end of Saturday. I mean, that's pretty neat. So God did a miracle daily by sending the manna. He did a second miracle every Friday by causing the manna that fell then to last for, t for, the t for two days. That's pretty neat. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because Israel, just like you, was skeptical. Who is this Moses? Moses is writing some statements down here, and he, he claims it's God's word. Yeah, right, we weren't born yesterday. But when they saw these miracles... It's just like this prophet we were talking about. He claims to be a prophet. If everything he says comes to pass, and four years from now he predicts something's going to happen, guess what? Now we're, we're going to listen to him. We're going to listen to what he's got to say. What if he predicts some disaster? Well, at least we'll listen to him, won't we? Because if everything he says comes to pass that he's already given us, and so when Moses talked about these things and they saw these miracles, after a while they began to believe Moses. Verse 27, it came to pass, there went out some of the people on the seventh day to gather, and they found none. So every seventh day, it did not rain manna. How did Moses pull that off? It had to be a miracle from God. Verse 34, and the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron to lay it up before the, the testimony. See the capital T, the Ten Commandments, because <coughs> they were about ready. They had that box made. They were about ready to put the Ten Commandments in it. And the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years. Now look at chapter 17, verse 5. Repeat what book you're in. I'm in Exodus. Because I don't think the people online. Oh, okay. I'm in Exodus, and I'm in chapter 17. Verse 5, the Lord said, Go before the people, and uh, take your rod that you smoke the river, talking about the Red Sea. Behold, uh, verse 6, I will stand before you there upon the rock, or smite the rock, and now they don't have any water to drink, so now miraculously water comes out of the rock. And verse 7, notice, they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Moses, are you really speaking on behalf of God or not? How do we know this is really true? Look at verse 14. Chapter 17, verse 14. And the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. And rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, and so on. So now Moses is commanded by God to start writing things, and he's a prophet, and he's inspired. Now the concept of canonicity begins. The concept of canonicity is now started. Look at chapter uh, 19 and verse 6. Excuse me. 19 verse 6. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, God is saying to Israel. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words. The people said in verse 8, whatever God has spoken, we'll do it. So now they're beginning to believe Moses. Just a, a wee bit here. Verse 11, and be ready against the third day, because that's when God was going to come down on Mount Sinai. Now verse 16 it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet coming from the mount. And there ain't nobody up there. Nobody was allowed to go up there. And the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Again, this has to be something supernatural. 
Verse 19. Well, the verse 18, look at the last. Well, let's read the whole verse because it's so important. Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke. No way Moses could have done that. Now, with our modern technology, we might be able to pull off a hoax, but he couldn't do it in that day. Because the Lord descended upon it in a fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. Ain't no way Moses could have pulled that off. And the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed. That means it grew louder and louder. And Moses spoke, and God answered by him by a voice. And the people heard this. Verse 20, And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and so on. So they know now, hey, when, when Moses says God speaks to him, hey, we believe it. We absolutely believe he's telling the truth. You don't need to turn there, but if you're taking notes, Hebrews 12 Verses 19 through 21 talks about this very event. And in verse 21, it's, Moses said, I myself trembled. It scared Moses out of his wits. I myself quaked and I trembled exceedingly. That's in Hebrews uh, 12, 21. So we see then that this was something that was a supernatural thing. Look at chapter 20. Verse 1, God spoke, not Moses. God spoke all these words. And if you read Deuteronomy 4, Moses says, you heard the voice of God. This wasn't God speaking through Moses. They actually heard the audible voice of God. And the Ten Commandments are given. And then verse 18, and the people saw the thunderings. The people did. The lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountains smoking. When the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. Scared the daylights out of them. Now verse 19, very important. And they said to Moses, now remember in verse, where we are now, verses 18 and 19, they have already heard the audible voice of God. The mountain is shaking, the trumpets are getting louder and louder, and it's scaring the daylights. And Moses says, I quaked and trembled. It scared him. Now the people said this to Moses. All the people saw the thunders and lightnings. Verse 19, and they said to Moses, speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. They heard the voice of God and they said, We don't want to do that anymore. Let him talk to you. And whatever you tell us, we will accept that as the word of God. The principle of canonicity started with Moses. Verse 22, the Lord said to Moses, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel. Now, they're getting it directly through Moses. You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Chapter 21 and verse 1. Now, these are the judgments which you shall set before them. And then chapters 21, 22, and 23. God would have given it to them off of Mount Sinai, but these people were scared. So God gave it to Moses and Moses gave it to them. But it's still the word of God. And they promised to accept it as God's word. Now look at chapter 24 and verse 3. After <clears throat> these judgments are given, God spoke audibly the Ten Commandments, and then the judgments in those three chapters, 21 through 23, were given directly to Moses. He gave it to the people. Then in chapter 24, the Old Covenant is now ratified. In verse 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of who? Lord. Of the Lord. And they said, okay, we accept it. And all the judgments and all the people answered and said, all the words which Moses has made up. Are you reading with me? All the words that the Lord has said, we will do it. Moses, we now believe you're really hearing from God. This is where the principle of canonicity came from. Verse 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, all of them, including the Ten Commandments. He wrote them down. Now, we know that God made tablets but here's the problem with those stone tablets. Nobody can read them. They made the Ark of the Covenant, put them in the covenant, put them in the Ark, took a lid and put on it. Remember what happened in David's day when 50,000 people opened up the lid and looked in? Anybody remember what happened? 50,000 people died. You don't look inside the Ark. Remember what happened to Indiana Jones? True story, right? Well, that's it could have happened, but that was based on scripture. You know that hey, you don't want to look in the ark. Indiana Jones tells the girl, "Don't look, don't look." So they got their eyes closed, and the Nazis, their flesh is melting off their their bones. It's a horrible thing. If you've never seen that movie, what was the name of that one? Was, uh, that was the first one. No, Raiders, Raiders, Raiders of the Lost Ark. The, the very first one, Raiders of the Lost Ark. If you've never seen that, see what happens when you look into the ark. So here's what's going to happen. 
God gave all these commandments, so Moses had to write it down, and they put it in the side of the ark, because they can't open the lid, see? So he put it in the side of the ark, and I'll talk about that more as we get into this. Why did he do that? So he wrote all the words of the Lord, chapter 20, where it was audibly spoken, and then chapters 21 through 23, when Moses was simply spoken to by God alone. He wrote all the words of the Lord. Now, verse 7, and he took the book. Moses is now writing. He's in the book writing business. He took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. Now, the book of the covenant is how many chapters? Y'all remember this from bachelor's class? Four chapters. Okay, four chapters. He took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. So they now accepted this as the word of God, just like Jesus calls it the word of God. Verse 9, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders went up there. Verse 10, and they saw the God of Israel. This was no hoax that Moses pulled off. They saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. Verse 11, and upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw God. The nobles did. And they did eat and drink. They didn't die. And they saw God. Verse 11, I already read that. Verse 12, And the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me in the mount and be there, and I'll give you tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written. Now, God also wrote Scripture with his own finger. That Scripture went into the Ark of the Covenant that you may teach them. This was God's own right. Now, look at uh, verse uh, I hope I wrote this down correctly. Chapter 34 of Exodus. Yeah, one verse, chapter 34 and verse 27. The Lord said to Moses, write thou these words. Now, Jesus said in, in John 7, 19, if memory serves, that God gave the law or, or that the law was given to Moses. God gave the law to Moses. The Lord said, write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee with Israel. That's Exodus 34, verse 27. Are there any questions at this point? Now. Huh? So nobody logged on? Yes, they've logged on. Okay, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Great. So <clears throat> at this point, they no doubt accepted Moses as a prophet. Now, let's go to the book of Numbers, chapter 12. We're talking about how did canonicity originate? Why would they accept Moses as a prophet of God? Well, if you'd heard the audible voice of God and you'd seen all these great miracles, I don't think you'd have trouble believing that he really was a servant of God. He was really hearing from God. Chapter 12 of, uh, of uh, Numbers. Let's start in verse 6. The Lord came down in a pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came. And verse 6, And he, God, said, Hear now my words... Now they're hearing he got his audible voice. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him. How? In a vision. And I'll speak to him in a dream. But that's not how Moses is, verse 7. Moses doesn't have to worry about dreams and visions. Verse 8, for with him I'll speak mouth to mouth. In other words, audibly, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. He saw God as well. Therefore, then, why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Brother, you better stand in all of this word. These are the words of God. And Jesus echoed that. These are the words of God. Why were you not afraid? They heard the audible voice of God. Nobody could deny it. Number 7 and verse 89. And when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, with God, then he, Moses, heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubims. Now he's standing on the outside of that curtain, but behind the curtain hears the audible voice of God. Numbers 16. <clears throat> Verse 1, now Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, verse 2, rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly. Verse 3, they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. I mean, after all of this, 
they're still skeptical and said to them you take too much upon you who do you think you are i mean what you know even if god didn't tell us israel was stiff-necked i'd say they were at this point in time <laughs> i mean they see the red sea part and all these miracles and they still don't get it talk about hard-hearted well wait a minute if they were that hard-hearted how in the world did the books of moses ever make it into the canon well God just kept doing miracles until they finally, he finally got through their thick heads. But it wasn't something they immediately accepted. They weren't gullible. Verse 3, they gathered themselves against Moses. They said, you take too much upon yourselves. When Moses heard it, verse 4, he fell upon his face. Now, verse 28, Moses said, hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me, because they still had questions, to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own hand. I don't see how he could have. If these men, Cordedath and Abiram and the 250 princes, if they die of the common death, they die of old age. If they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertains to them, and they go down quick into the pit, which is Sheol, which is the grave, then you shall understand that, that these men have not provoked me. They've provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder, split, that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses and all the men that appertained to Korah and all their goods. Verse 33, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. Now let me ask you, how did Moses make the earth cleave a sudden? That's a good trick. Even we can't do that with our technology. Can't predict earthquakes, but we can make them happen. Say it's going to happen in five minutes. Five minutes, think, oh, and only swallows them up. Now let me show you how humble the Israelites were. Look at verse 41. But on the morrow, all the congregation of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. Stiff-necked, hard-headed, and rebellious. Dear me, you'd think they'd have got it by now. In fact, uh, verse I didn't read verse 34. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. Verse 35, there came out a fire from the Lord. Hey, Moses couldn't have done that. And consumed the 250 men that offered incense. So Cordath and Abiram went down into the ground, and fire came out of heaven and killed these guys. And they still are having trouble believing Moses. So they weren't gullible. Now, you know the story how that they murmured, and God said, that's it, I'm going to let you die in the wilderness. Now, let's go to, um, well, let's see here. My notes. Uh, so, we know that Moses wrote these things down. Let's go to Deuteronomy 4. Forty years later, after they, they're dying in the wilderness, they're getting a little bit humble at this point. Chapter 4 and verse 9. Take heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen. Because if they'd remember what they'd seen, they know that God was working with Moses. Don't let them depart from your heart, but you're to teach them to your sons. You're to teach them to your grandsons. Verse uh, 10, especially how you stood before the Lord in horror. You heard his audible voice. Verse 11, you came near and stood at the mountain. You saw the thick darkness. Verse 12, and the Lord spoke to you. Not just Cecil Beetle Mill has God speaking only to Moses on Mount Sinai. No, the whole congregation, three million people, heard the voice of God. You heard the voice of the words. You didn't see his similitude. You didn't see what he looked like, but you heard a voice. Verse 13, he declared to you his covenant, and he commanded you to perform the Ten Commandments, which he wrote upon two tables of stone. So they heard God's voice. By this time, they're getting the point, finally. Verse 15, therefore, take good heed to yourselves. You saw no manner of similitude. On the day the Lord spoke to you, so they heard God's voice. Verse 33, the next page, <laughs> if you have a Schofield Bible. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you heard and lived? So they know that God is speaking 
Therefore, Moses, whatever Moses writes down, are the words of God. Chapter uh, 9 and verse 23. Do I have that right by the right scripture? Well, verse 23 said, you, the last part, you believed him not nor hearkened to his voice. You've been rebellious from the day that I, that I, um, that I knew you. But that's not the scripture. I think I wrote down the wrong scripture here. Well, no, it mentions about the fact that they heard his voice, mm -hmm. but they didn't believe it. And 24 says, they were been rebellious against the Lord from the day I knew you. But what I've got here in my notes uh, is that uh, Moses started writing the words down, which I don't know why I don't have. Um, okay. yeah, let's go to 13. Maybe it's there. Chapter 13. Verse 18. When you shall hearken to the voice of the Lord your God to keep all its commandments, which I command you. I'm commanding you what God told you to do. And do what is right and proper and so on. So he's saying that they are supposed to obey God's words. But there's a scripture here that I didn't write down where Moses now represented the voice of God, but that's close enough. And then Deuteronomy chapter 27. Deuteronomy 27. You probably say this is overkill, but that's good. At least you won't forget it, I hope. Don't forget it like Israel forgot it. 27 and verse 10. Thou shalt therefore obey not the voice of Moses, but the voice of the Lord thy God, which now they knew was the voice of God, to do his commandments and statutes, which I command you. So Moses wrote these laws down, but he says they're the laws of God and is the voice of God that we actually have here. Now, by this time, I guess they got it. Now, I'm talking about the principle of canonicity. Who preserved the writings of Moses? Because Moses died. Look at chapter 31. Very, 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 very important scripture. Chapter 31 of Deuteronomy. Verse 9. Moses wrote this law and he put it under the mattress of his bed for safekeeping. Now, you know that wouldn't have worked, right? He delivered the book of the law to the priest, the sons of Levi, who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and unto the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of seven years, it says every, the word every is in italics, but it just means seven years, and the solemnity of the year of release and the Feast of Tabernacles, when all the Israels appears, you shall, verse 11, the last two lines, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Now, I want you to think, we haven't read the part about where he put it in the side of the ark, but Moses wrote the law. Now, the, the tablets were inside the ark of the covenant. Let's say this is the ark of the covenant. Then Moses took his writings and, and had, or the high priest, which would have been either Aaron or Eliezer, and they attached it to the side of the ark. Not because, now the seventh day of Genesis, that shows it's not as important as the Ten Commandments. Duh. The Ten Commandments were written in this too. The reason that they put it on the side of the ark, stupid, is because they can't open the door. They, they can't look in there. So that to read the Ten Commandments, they had to read what Moses had written here. They couldn't read the tablets in there. You understand? It's not that this is less important. Because not only were the other things written in this thing that was on the side of the ark, but the Ten Commandments were there also. That's how we know what the Ten Commandments say. I've never seen those tablets, have you? So how do we know what's on them? Because Moses wrote down. But the Seventh day Adventists say, well, that proves it's not as important. <laughs> Crazy. So Moses gave it to the priest. The priest had a tabernacle by this time. The priest would have kept it in the tabernacle for safekeeping. Now that's pretty good because. Who's going to go in there and steal it? Nobody is allowed inside. I could draw you a diagram like I've done before. Remember, if you're in a helicopter looking down, there are two compartments to the tabernacle. The first compartment, only the priest can go into. And the second compartment, the Holy of Holies, who could go in there? The only the high priest. That's like putting it in a, in, a, in a Chase Manhattan bank vault 
It was protected there. Nobody could get it. And it was put right there on the side of the ark. The only person who's even going to see it is the high priest. Boy, that's protecting it. Remember what it says in Psalm 12, verses 6 through 7. God will preserve his word. It, the priest had God's word, and it was preserved all those years. But not only that, the autographs. These were the autographs, meaning the actual piece of paper or whatever it was, vellum or whatever, that Moses laid his hand on and wrote the Ten Commandments. While we're here in chapter 31, look at verse 24. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing. That's why we've got the books of Moses. The words of, of this law in a book until they were finished. That Moses commanded the Levites, which bore the Ark of the Covenant, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness. Okay, so they preserved the autographs, the actual words of God that Moses had written down. It couldn't have been in a safer place than to be there in the tabernacle with the priest. They preserved it. So, remember every seven years the priest had to read God's law? There are three million people. They didn't have TV. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what I'm getting ready to say, but just think about it. Let's say these are the actual autographs on the side. How they put it on the side of the ark without touching the ark, I'm not too sure. But anyway, they attached it to the side of the ark. The high priest could only go in there once a year. So, next October, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest walks into the Holy of Holies. He grabs the autographs, and he walks out. He can't go back in for another whole year. You know what they did with the autographs? Take a guess. They made copies. Now, there's a lot of material here. If you were, to, if I were to give you a homework assignment, go home and copy Genesis one through Deuteronomy thirty-four. How long would it take you? Well, the computer maybe not too long, but they had to do it by hand. Assuming that several priests worked on it, when one got tired, the other one did. Let's say that they could do it every six weeks. We're looking at maybe. 10 copies could be made. And it would take them, you know, a whole year, maybe to make 10 copies, okay? So next October, guess what? The high priest, he comes back into the Holy of Holies, and he puts it back in safekeeping. Now, where he kept it in the middle time, he probably did keep it under his mattress because he had to, he couldn't go back in there. So the, it, the, the autograph stayed with the high priest. The next year, they put it back in there. What did they do with, let's say, 10 copies that they had made? They made more copies. Now, now, I'm just using the number 10 as, a, as an illustration. If they made 10 the first year, and the next year they could have made 10 off of each one then, they might have had 100. So in seven years, how many copies did they have where all Israel could hear the law because they had thousands of priests after a period of time? Each priest had his own copy. This is a copy now. And it belongs at my house. So every seven years when all the people came together, the law had to be read. Now, over a period of time, they noticed some variance. Hi, hi, priest, come here, I want to ask you something. His copy says the, and my copy says a. Hey, could you check the autographs to see which one's right? Every October, day of atonement, priest goes in there, pulls it back out. Let's check all these copies, make sure they're right, make some new copies. Do some collation. They kept it pure. Now, you're going to ask me, well, what happened to the autographs? Well, what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? If they were to find the Ark of the Covenant, they may find the actual handwriting of Moses. Wouldn't that be exciting? And it may be there. It could actually be there. We don't know. But the copies were very meticulously copied because by now they believe that Moses had actually written this. All right. Now that's my introduction. Now let's get into the let's get into some more stuff here. What about uh, after Moses died? Well, go with me to a few pages over to Joshua who was also a prophet and is considered the first book of the prophets. In chapter 1, verse 1, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua. Understand something. They didn't just get a prompting like, I feel the Lord would have me to tell you such and such. Poppycock. God spoke to them and said, you know, do this, do that. God spoke to them. So these prophets actually heard from God. Now go to Joshua chapter 8. 
and verse 31. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 31, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, and offered stones as made in stone. Verse 32, and he, Joshua, wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses. So now, not only do they have it in paper or vellum or whatever it might have been, now they've got it engraved in stone. I don't know if it was engraved or maybe they used some kind of paint and wrote it, but they made it in such a way that it wouldn't erase or be wiped out by rain. So it would be a permanent thing. So chapter 23 of Joshua. Did Joshua hear from God? Chapter 23 and verse 6. Be therefore very courageous and keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses that you turn not aside from the right hand or to the left. So, so Joshua is told, be courageous, don't don't turn aside from all that is written. So now we actually have scriptures, don't we? We actually have scriptures. Jesus said, have you not read in the scripture? You do err not knowing the scripture. And he's talking about the books of Moses. Are there any questions so far? Look at chapter 24. Chapter 24 and verse 26. And Joshua wrote these words... In the book of the law of God. They're adding it now to the five books of Moses. So guess what? After Deuteronomy, Joshua comes next. He now added it to the law. Not that he's adding to God's law or taken away from it, but he's adding his writings to Moses' writings and took a great stone and set it there under the oak and so on and so on. So now Joshua is writing scripture. He's a prophet. Now, according to scholars, and I've been reading a lot of these scholars, they believe that Judges and Ruth and 1 Samuel was written by the prophet Samuel. Well, Samuel was a prophet. How do we know? Remember when Samuel was a little boy? Do you remember? And Eli was the high priest. Remember what happened? Anybody, can anybody tell me? Nobody remembers what happened when he was a little boy? You tell us, John. God spoke to him, like you were saying about God spoke to Joshua. He heard the voice. All the voice. He misunderstood. He thought it was Eli calling for him. Y'all remember that? Yeah. So he ran to Eli and said, I'm here. And Eli said, I didn't call you. Three times. Three times. He said, if that happens again, you say your servant hears. Listen. Yeah. So he did, and then God spoke to him. God spoke to him. With Samuel Prophet. Yeah, he heard the audible voice of God. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. Here's an, an amazing revelation I'm going to give you. I am not a prophet. I'm not, really, and truly, I'm not a prophet. Because God does not give me an audible voice to speak to you. I may get a prompting. The Holy Spirit may lead me and guide me. The Bible leads me and guide me. But that doesn't make me a prophet. But Samuel heard the audible voice of God, and everybody in Israel began to respect him as a prophet of God. Everybody did. Who was it that anointed Saul and David? It was Samuel. Now, Keith, yes. I have a question <laughs> or a comment. I can easily believe that Samuel wrote Judges and Ruth, mm -hmm. uh, but I have a bit of a problem with where Samuel. <coughs> he's going to write for Samuel 25, and Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented. And scholars Judges. tell us that he did write First Samuel. Obviously, he didn't write the end of it. Well, this is not, not the end. It's like about seven chapters later. Yeah. He may have written the early part. And the second Samuel, I don't think he wrote He started Samuel. the book, but he didn't finish he it. He started it, yeah. Also, and, Ruth goes all the way down to give a genealogy to David. And I guess Samuel could have done that because he knew David. He could have, but then also you have Ezra who obviously edited yeah. under inspiration the books, for example, in Genesis, it says from, you know, all the way up to Dan, you know, and so on like that. Yeah. So obviously it was written. It could have been amended, yeah. But I'll tell you something else, too. We, we say the Chronicles was written by Ezra. There's some problems with that, too. Oh, yeah. There are problems yeah. with that, too. Sure. Somebody, Ezra yeah. might have edited Chronicles, but he didn't actually write it. Because one of the statements in First Chronicles, I believe it's First Chronicles, is that temple is it's there in the temple to this day. Well, it wasn't in Ezra's day. Because it was talking about well, the song. I think he was probably copying out of a previous document that said it was there to this day when that document was written. And that could have been too. There's different ways um, of. But uh, I don't have that. a problem with Ruth, though, because Samuel knew David, so he could very well have known the story of David's yeah. ancestry. And they believe he wrote Judges. Yeah. And Judges and Ruth were one book in the 22 book canon. Yeah. Look at 1 Samuel 10. 
and verse 25. We're talking about the principle of how the books were put together, how they were canonized. First Samuel 10, 25, Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Now, if you lay it up before the Lord, remember the Ark of the Covenant represented the Lord. Where did he lay it up? In the tabernacle. He didn't put it up under the mattress of his bed. He laid it up before the Lord. He brought it, and the priest preserved Samuel's writings because they knew him to be a prophet. So Samuel added to the collection, and Samuel, in, in 1 Samuel 3, heard the audible voice of God. So now we come to the writing prophets. Now don't turn there, but Acts chapter 2 and verse 30 says, David was a prophet. God personally appeared to Solomon even. It's believed that Isaiah wrote 2 Samuel and Kings and Ezra at least wrote or edited Chronicles. Moses wrote the book of Job, because that's the oldest book in the Bible. Scholars say this. I have no doubt that this is accurate. I don't see any problem with it. Ezra was also not only a priest, he was a scribe, and he was obviously a prophet because used him. He and, and Ezra and Nehemiah are considered one book in the 22-book canon. Canon. Maybe Ezra even helped Nehemiah. Uh, I don't know if Nehemiah was a prophet or not, so who's to say? Maybe Ezra even wrote Nehemiah. We don't know. Although Nehemiah, Nehemiah speaks of Nehemiah himself in the first person. person. He speaks in the first person. That's true. Well, Ezra could have edited the book. He could have, yeah. So Ezra was even contemporaneous with Esther, so he may have even written Esther. Uh, we're not sure. And then, of course, you, it was at that time he lived in the time of Artaxerxes, which... The consensus among rabbis was is that all the prophets stopped, the writing prophets ceased in the time of Artaxerxes in the in the fifth century BC. That was it, it was over and done with in the four hundreds, around four fifty BC. And therefore I think your dates are correct with that Malachi was written around four fifty, is that what you Four seventy five. Four seventy five, okay. So that would be that would fit right Dr. in. Carthy. That would fit right in. Okay. Now how did the Jews know these books were truly the word of God? I want you to take a look at, uh, you say one thing, because they, they knew that God was working through them. Like Moses, no doubt God was working through them. Let's look, look at um, 2 Chronicles chapter 12. And verse 15. I mean, First Chronicles, anything of it, right? Now, here's an interesting question. Second Chronicles 12 and verse 15. Now, the acts of Rehoboam, first and last, are they not written in the book of Shimei the prophet? What, what, what verse? Verse 15. Second Chronicles 12, verse 15. Now, Shimei was a prophet. Now, Elijah, we, we say Elijah was a prophet, but he made no writings. Elisha made no writings. But Shimei did. Where's the book of Shimei? He wrote, he was a prophet. The Bible says he was a prophet. And Ebedo the seer, concerning genealogies, he was a seer, another name for prophet. And there were wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually, and so on. Let me give you an answer to this. We have no lost books of the Bible. Do you remember that Jesus said in John... 1034, the scripture cannot be broken. The Greek word there is from the word luos, meaning loosed. We're not going to, where's the word lost come from? From the word loose. If you, I, 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 I think I, I, I lost my keys. They, they're they lost because I, I loosed them from my keychain, and now they're lost. They've been loosed. If you lose your keys, they're lost. If you lose your glasses, they're lost. If you lose your Bible, it's lost. Jesus said the scriptures cannot be loosed, or in other words, they can't be lost. There are no lost books of the Bible. Now, the King James says the scriptures cannot be broken. Look it up in the Greek. The scriptures cannot be lost. Well, then what happened to Shimei the prophet? Even though he was inspired to write that, it was never to be a part of the canon because Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7 says God will preserve his word throughout all generations. If it wasn't preserved, it's nothing you need to be concerned with. If they, some archaeologist, takes a shovel and goes out here and digs and finds the book of Shimei tomorrow, 
oh, we got to put this in the Bible. No, we don't. Even if it's inspired, because it wasn't preserved. What did Paul say in Romans 3? The, the words of God were given to the Jews to preserve. If they didn't preserve the book of Shimei, then we don't worry about it. Questions? We discussed this in, uh, in the Old Testament origins, the book of Shemiah. Oh, there. did you? Okay, I'd like to hear and, that. And uh, what we concluded was that Shemiah was like Elijah, that he was a speaking prophet who spoke the words of God to the people, but that when he wrote his book, he was just acting as an ordinary human being. As a historian, he's writing a book about the acts of Rehoboam, not under the inspiration of God. His, his spoken messages as a prophet were under the inspiration of God, but they're not recorded. His written book was not given under inspiration of God. It was simply a book. That sounds good. A history book. And the same with uh, Ido, the seer, who's writing about genealogies. He was like my mother, who was very interested in genealogy and wrote a lot of stuff about genealogy. That doesn't mean it was inspired by God. Right. In other words, it was an authoritative writing but it wasn't considered scripture, and therefore it was not in the canon. Right. Now, the high school book that you had, the history book that you had in high school, was not scripture. God didn't inspire it. There might have been even a few little tiny historical errors, but it was authoritative. World War I started in 1914. World War II started in the late 1930s. Hitler invaded Poland, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's an authoritative writing. The only thing that can become scripture is what is authoritative. But not all, of, all scripture is authoritative, but like you just pointed out, not all authoritative writings make up scripture. When Jesus said, you do err not knowing the scripture, he's talking about the 22 books, which leaves out any authoritative writings that were not preserved. Does that make sense to everybody? I'll say it again. Any books that were not preserved, no matter how authoritative, are not scripture. Because scripture, according to Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7, are to be preserved. Does everybody see that? Is that clear as mud? Any questions? What is canonized? Well, there's a lot of authoritative books, but the only thing that's canon is that is what has been concerned, what is considered to be authoritative scripture. Do we have a, there's a question regarding this. Okay. It says, if we're not meant to have these writings, why tell us about them? Because uh, Jesus said in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. There's other scriptures that say, for example, when Joshua made the sun stand still, and he's writing about it, and he says, well, uh, I, I don't I think it was there in Joshua. He said, well, look at the book of Jasher. There are other authoritative books that were considered authoritative to verify what I'm telling you. Like secular history, but to Sec verify scripture. Secular history. Hey, and the sun did stand still. And that's what Shemaiah's book was. It was secular history. Secular history, even though a prophet wrote it. Yes, sir. It's sort of like us referring back to Josephus as a historical writing. Oh, yeah. And then yeah. Uh, if you really think about who it's referring to, it's talking about the acts of uh, uh, Robot. I'm not going to say it right. Uh, Rehoboam? Rehoboam, yeah. Rehoboam. Okay, what was his acts? If you really think that, uh, what he did, it's just being recorded in a history book. Yeah. So it's just referring to the historical acts that he did. Yeah. Before that. And those would be true and accurate. They'd be authoritative histories. But God never intended them to be in his holy word. But this, you know, can be a verification for any, a secular verification to scripture. If anybody were to doubt scripture, you can say, look, this secular person. The secular person, yeah. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I start with the scholars. What did the scholars say? Let's, let's find out what they say first. I would, I would predict, if anything, that if we found this, book of Shemei the prophet yeah. it would be very interesting and it might fill in a lot of gaps in our knowledge about Rehoboam but it would not contradict anything that says in the Bible. If it's authoritative it won't contradict what God inspired in the Bible yeah okay now I'm going to get into part two of today's message. We've only got 15 minutes but we can cover a lot in 15 minutes how did the Jews know which books were truly the word of God for example, <clears throat> later on, you know, we, you know, after Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah, you, you get into uh, eventually you get into uh, uh, you get into the Psalms, which were written by David. He was a prophet, but then you get into the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. How do we know they should be part of the canon? Now, remember, I asked you at the very beginning. I said Jesus put his stamp of approval on those twenty-two books. My question today is, 
how did the Jews know which books were supposed to be in the canon? Well, the answer is they found out they were inspired, right? Let's prove it, to prove all things. For, let's look at Ezekiel to start with. Ezekiel, let's start in chapter 12. Go past Psalms and Proverbs and Isaiah and Jeremiah. We're going to start in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 12 and verse 17. The word of the Lord, so he says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Verse 20, and the cities that are inhabited shall be laid waste. And he made these predictions of things that were going to happen. Uh, <clears throat> verse 26, again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son, they of the house of Israel say the vision that he sees is for many days, and he prophesies of the times that are far off. But verse 28 says, Thus says the Lord, there shall none of my words be prolonged anymore. They were about to find out if Ezekiel was a prophet or not. So he predicted the coming captivity. Look at well, chapter 25 simply talks about verses 1 through 17. Let me just show you what it talks about. And starting in verse 1, the prophecy against the Ammonites. These are Arabs. Verse 12, the prophecy, uh, the coming judgment upon Edom. Chapter 26, the coming judgment upon Tyre. And those things happened. Tyre was destroyed. These are things that happened that the Jews could easily verify. Could and, verify by secular history, right? <clears throat> yeah, there's secular history verified. Secular history verified. Verified this, uh, yeah. So obviously he's predicting it before it happens. They know he's a prophet. Uh, in uh, chapter 26, it talks about the, the judgment upon Tyre. Verse 5, um, well, verse 3, Tyre will be destroyed like the, the waves that come up on the seashore. <coughs> it, the, Tyre wasn't destroyed on one occasion. It was destroyed by different armies, one after another, all the way into the 300s. Alexander came up and built a causeway out there to the island, and he and so it was destroyed little by little by little by little. Verse 5, it shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. And I've seen pictures that show fishermen spreading their nets on those um, skyscrapers that they had in Tyre. Verse 12, the last three lines, and they shall lay their, your stones and your timber and your dust in the midst of the water. Verse 14, I'll make you like the top of a rock, You'll, it'll be a place to spread nets. Thou shalt be built no more. Verse 20, the last two lines, thou shalt not be inhabited. Verse 21, I'll make you a terror and you shall be no more. You shall never be found again, says the Lord. So when Tyre was destroyed, they said, hey, Ezekiel, he got it right. He got it right. So they knew that he was a prophet of God. <coughs> but now Sidon was never prophesied to be destroyed. In chapter 28, starting in verse 20, the judgment on Sidon. Now it was to be destroyed, but never to be uninhabited, or, or there was no curse on it to never be rebuilt. And to my knowledge, I think Sidon still exists, doesn't it? I believe it still does. Over I think here. it's known as Beirut nowadays. Is, it Be is that Beirut? I think so. I'm not positive. Uh, but anyway, Sidon was never prophesied to be destroyed. Now here's the thing. Sidon was an older city than Tyre. If any city would be destroyed, it'd be Sidon. Instead, Ezekiel said, no, it won't be Sidon, it'll be Tyre. And Tyre was the New York of the ancient world. It was destroyed, and Sidon remained. Interesting. So that's how they knew that Ezekiel belonged in what was now a growing canon. Now, a canon means a closed collection. It hadn't yet been closed, but they knew they had scripture, and Ezekiel is now added because they know it came to pass, just like he said. How do we know that Jeremiah was supposed to be in the Bible. And this is highly interesting. This is probably as far as we can get today. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 20. Let's go backwards now to Jeremiah. <clears throat> Something you need to know about Jeremiah. When he gave his prophecy, his prophecy in a nutshell was, Judah will be taken into captivity. And all the priests said, and no way. We don't want to hear that. The king said, we don't like this. This is treasonous, what you're saying. He said, you surrender to the king of Babylon. And they said, no, we won't. And they, they even put him in a quagmire to let him die. They hated Jeremiah because of his prophecy. Chapter 20, verse 1, thus says the Lord. This is not Jeremiah talking. This is God speaking through Jeremiah. God has given him the word. Go and get a potter's earthen vessel. Verse 2, and go forth in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Verse 3, and say, hear the word of the Lord. So this is God giving Jeremiah this prophecy. Chapter, oh, I'm in chapter 19. Dear me, I should be in chapter 20. 
Uh, chapter 20, verse 1. Pastor, the son of so and so, the priest, these were the priests. They heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Verse 2, what was their reaction? They gave him the key to the city, right? No, verse 2, they smoked Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks. They did not like his prophecies at all. Verse 4, the last uh, four lines. I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. That's not the kind of thing you want to hear your prophet tell you. Jeremiah did not know how to win friends and influence people. He had never read Dale Carnegie's book. Verse 6, and thou, Pasher, the guy that smote him, and all that dwell in your house shall go into captivity, and thou shalt come to Babylon, and there thou shalt die, and shalt be buried there, thou and all thy friends to whom thou hast prophesied lies. He called him a liar to his face. Well, how do we know Jeremiah was right? Let's look at chapter 25 and verse 9. Chapter 25 and verse 9. This is the prophecy concerning the 70 years captivity. Now, how did Jeremiah predict that way off in the future if he didn't hear from God? But again, the priest did not believe he was hearing from God. Verse 9, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north. Says the Lord, this is not Jeremiah's guess, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, will bring them into this land against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about. There will be perpetual desolations. Verse 11, and this whole land shall be desolation and an astonishment, and these nations that shall serve the king of Babylon, not just Israel, but all these various nations that he was taking over. They're going to serve him for 70 years. Verse 12, and it shall come to pass. Now, here's the interesting thing. Prophets very seldom give you dates. This guy gives you a date, 70 years, not 69, 70. It shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished. I'll punish the king of Babylon, and that nation, says the Lord, for their iniquity, <clears throat> and... Verse 13, I'll bring that upon that land, all the words that I've pronounced against it. All that is written, this is verse 13, all that is written in this book. Do we have the word of God in our hand today? Which Jeremiah has prophesied against all these nations. Now, Jeremiah, anybody can claim to be speaking for God, but how do they know if this was really God talking how can we be positively sure? Jeremiah 26, verse 11. Then spoke the priest and the prophets to the princes. They said, this man is worthy to die. They hated Jeremiah. For he's, he's prophesied against this city, against Jerusalem. As you've heard with your ears. Then spoke Jeremiah and said, the Lord sent me to prophesy. So the priests and the prophets said, let's kill Jeremiah. Well, then, well, let me ask you this question. If they hated Jeremiah, why is Jeremiah in the Bible? Anybody know? After the fact, they looked back and said, oops, he was telling the truth. Maybe his prophecy really was from God. Maybe we should include that along with Ezekiel. Maybe we should include it along with Joshua. You see how, you see how it happened? It's not like these people were gullible when some false prophet walks in and says, oh, I got a message from God. Great, we'll add it to the Bible. Ah, uh -uh. they did not want to add it to the Bible, but when the prophecies came to pass and came to pass and came to pass, what could they do? Verse 16, who, who rescued Jeremiah? Not the priest. It was the princes, the secular leaders. Then said the princes and all the people to the priest and the prophets, this man's not worthy to die. Verse 17, then rose up certain of the elders and spoke to the assembly and said, Micah the Morshite, he said this and that and so on and so on. They didn't put him to death. But verses 23, 24, there was another guy named Uriah who was preaching the same thing and they did kill him. No. I know about Uriah. No. <laughs> oh, she wrote a book on him, didn't you? Yeah, I did. You wrote a pseudopigrapha. Well, I, I wrote a pseudopigrapha called the book of Uriah. I remember that now, yeah. This is where it came from. <laughs> so they killed Uriah. Chapter 28, verse 1. It came to pass in the same year, the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah in the fifth month. Verse 2, Jeremiah said, Thus speaks the Lord, the God of Israel. I have broken the yoke. No, wait a minute. Hold on here. I need to read that whole thing there <clears throat> because I'm missing some here. Verse 1 says, It came to pass in the same year, in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azar, the prophet, who was of Gibeon, spoke unto, unto me, Jeremiah said. He came to me and spoke to me in the house of the Lord in the presence of the priest. Verse 2, Hananiah said, Thus speaks the Lord. Now, any fool can say that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay? So let's find out. By the way, have you read the book of Hananiah? Have you read the book of Hananiah? What, where's the book of Hananiah? Hmm. <laughs> Thus speaks the Lord, so he said, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Really? Within two full years, now he's setting dates, I'll bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house with that Nebuchadnezzar took away. Verse 4, and I'll bring again to the place Jeconia, he's a, he's a king, the son of Jehoiakim, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. In just two more years, it's going to happen. Now they did what you and I did. They put it on the shelf and say, let's watch and see. Mm -hmm. Verse 20, verse 5, then the prophet Jeremiah said to the prophet Hananiah, verse 6, he didn't say, oh, that's going to make me look bad. And you know what he said? He said, amen, the Lord do so. Now that makes me out to look stupid, but I hope you're right. I hope you're right. The Lord performed thy words, which you prophesied. I want that to happen, to bring again the vessels of the Lord's house. Verse 7, nevertheless, hear thou now this word that I speak in your ears and all the ears of the people. Verse 8, the prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against kingdoms. Verse 9, the prophet that prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then the prophet shall be known that the Lord is truly sent him. That's why the book of Jeremiah is in the Bible. Then Hananiah, where's his book? The prophet took the yoke from off of the prophet Jeremiah's neck because he was wearing a yoke to show what would happen. They'd come under the yoke of Babylon. Hananiah broke it, verse 11. He spoke in the presence of all the people. Thus says the Lord, even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. He goes home. Sounds good to me. Hope he's right. While he's going home, God speaks to Jeremiah. Verse 12. Then, as he's on his way, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after that Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke off of his neck. Verse 13. Jeremiah, don't go home. Go back. Go back and talk to him. Tell Hananiah, saying, Thus says the Lord. Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, and they'll serve him. And I've given him the beasts of the field. Verse 15, then said the prophet Jeremiah to Hananiah, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you. Jeremiah hoped that maybe God had changed his mind and sent Hananiah. He goes back and says, wait a minute, you big liar. God didn't send you, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year you shall die because you taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died. Same year and seventh month. Now verse 1 says it was in the fifth month, so two months later he died. Now, you and I are priests at the temple. These two prophets are going at it. Jeremiah says, we're all going into captivity. Hananiah says, no, we're not. Two years all going to be over. They're going to all come back. Now, who do you believe? Well, you don't want to believe Jeremiah. <laughs> Fooey on him. But Hananiah, oh, we like Hananiah. Guess what? Two months later, he falls over dead. In such a way, they know that it wasn't a homicide. They, somehow, they knew that, hey, he just fell over dead. Oops. Oops. Maybe Jeremiah is really the true prophet. But wait a minute. We don't have to accept Jeremiah yet. Hananiah said in two years. So they waited. They put it on the shelf, didn't they? They waited two more years. Oh, okay, so he died. That makes Jeremiah look good. But let's just forget that. We're going to put it on the shelf. Two years later, what happens? Nothing. Hananiah has proven now to be a false prophet. But now they've got one more prophecy to look at. Is Nebuchadnezzar really coming down and taking us over? They still don't accept Jeremiah's writings but it's beginning to look scary. And guess what? In 586 B.C., during Jeremiah's lifetime and the lifetime of these princes, Nebuchadnezzar comes in there and fulfills Jeremiah's prophecy to the letter. That's how the book of Jeremiah got put in the Bible. Are you beginning to see the principle of canonicity? It was authoritative. The way it ends up is Scripture. They know it's Scripture now because it's coming to pass. Jeremiah himself said, when it comes to pass, then you know God has spoken. They now knew how that God had spoken. I know this is somewhat repetition from lesson uh, three of the Prove All Things course, 
in our systematic theology course. But it's good to see how these prophecies got into the Bible. Now, years after Jeremiah had died, there's one more prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. What is it? Seventy years. Seventy years. And Daniel, who is a contemporary, but much younger, says, I was reading in the book of Jeremiah. In fact, let's read that one more thing and I'll let you go home. Let's read one more scripture here. Daniel 9. Daniel 9. I just want to read this one more to you. If you can find Ezekiel, it's just after Ezekiel, Daniel chapter 9. And uh, look at... Uh, Verse 2, Daniel 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, Ahasuerus, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. What Jeremiah's Now, Hananiah was not the word of the Lord. That's been proved. But Jeremiah was the word of the Lord that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. They're already considering Jeremiah to be a part of the Bible before the 70 years even came. Now, when the seven years were fulfilled, they knew that they knew that they knew that they knew that Jeremiah is supposed to be, that it really was Scripture, therefore it got canonized. They know it's Scripture, therefore it ended up in the canon. Do you see how these books ended up in the canon? Now, I'm not finished with this, but I'm not going to hold you longer. But <clears throat> next time, we're going to take a look at one more. We're going to look at Isaiah. How did Isaiah end up in the canon? And then from there... We're going to ease right on into how do we know we got the right books for the New Testament. Give me two minutes more before I let you go. Um, how do we know that we've got the right books for the New Testament? Because Jesus didn't say that that was Scripture, did he? Hadn't been written yet. So how do we know that we got the right books for the New Testament? How do we know? that the, the general epistles, which are so small, like 2nd and 3rd John, how do we know they're supposed to be in there? <clears throat> in the future, in the next few weeks, I'm going to give you some information about one of the most questionable books, 2nd Peter. Because a lot of the early church fathers did quote 2nd Peter. How do we know that's supposed to be in there? And you're going to find it very interesting when you hear it. Hebrews is anonymous. How do we know that it should be in there if we don't know who wrote it? And I'm going to give you some information about who wrote it based on the patristic writings. And how do we know we got all the books we're supposed to have of the New Testament? Okay, we have a question. How would the book of Jeremiah have spread quickly enough for Daniel to have gotten a copy? That's a good question. How would Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, have spread quickly enough? Well, uh, Daniel was among the royal seed. They would have probably gotten copies of the scriptures. And so it's very likely that, that uh, you know, that even though he was in captivity, he had been in the royal family before that. He probably had a, a copy of it before he ever went into captivity. Might have had it with him. We don't know. There were priests that took uh, the law with them. The priest continued to preserve the law during that 70 years they were in Babylon. They continued to make copies. I'm talking about the scribes now among the priests. The scribes continued to do that. Do you have a comment? Yeah, we did talk about this too in Old Testament origins. If you go to the end of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 52, uh -huh. you'll find an interesting piece of the fact that it, long after Jeremiah's most of the book was written, comes an event that happened in Jeremiah 52, 31. It came to pass in the 7 and 30th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, 37 years after the exile had started, um, in the 12th month, in the 5 and 20th day of the month, the evil Merodach king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and also brought him out of prison, spake kindly unto him, set his throne above the throne of kings, mm -hmm. changed his prison garments, for his mm -hmm. diet, it was given him every day, until the day of his death, Shortly. all the days of his life. All right, so now we have recorded in Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah, we have an incident that took place deep into the captivity, and then a statement that this went on for some time after that, so although Jeremiah wrote most of the book of Jeremiah, somebody had to finish up the book. Mm -hmm. Probably his secretary, Baruch, who Baruch. done the actual writing. So Baruch, who's younger than Jeremiah, outlives Jeremiah, finishes up the compilation of his book, and includes this little bit of information that happened in Babylonia. Last time we saw Baruch, he was in Egypt with Jeremiah. 
<laughs> but there's a lot of time gone by. Mm -hmm. Baruch could very easily have migrated from Egypt up to Babylonia, finished off the writing of the book of Jeremiah, and handed off a copy to Daniel. Very easily. Very easily. Thank you. Yeah. Interesting. Man, stuff gets fascinating. How many churches can you go to to hear this kind of information? Especially not today. You won't hear this kind of stuff. <laughs> People don't even talk about it because in most churches they think this whole book just dropped down out of heaven in one piece. Yeah. It's okay, here it is. Here it is. It just dropped out of heaven. It'd be nice if it did, but that's not how it happened. So what we want to let you know, I want you to be educated. When, when an infidel comes to you and says, well, how do you know that Bible's true? Somebody recently said, well, we all know it's full of contradictions. And I thought, you ignoramus. I forget who said that. But we all know it's full of contradictions. Where? Name one. Uh, there are some that look like contradictions to, until you understand it. And people just don't understand it. They got no, they're not qualified to be talking about it. Are there any other questions about this? I'm kind of leaving you hanging because we're not really finished. But next week... We're going to, I'm going to finish this and hit Isaiah for about 10 minutes or so. Then we're going to go into, well, how do we know about the New Testament books? We're going to ease into that. Any questions? It's, now it's when it's going to start really picking up interest because, or at least for me, because I like the New Testament even better. Any questions? All right. Well, good to see everybody here. Apologize for the beginning of the live stream. Yeah, we apologize for our uh, live streaming, the technical problems we had there so some people missed it a few verses there but you got the gist of it was only off about two minutes so anyway good to see everybody here all right any, any final questions at all are there any questions on there there's a comment okay what's the comment let's this read that this by far has been the best one so far oh good good okay because it's all scripture mm -hmm. we don't have to quote the infidels anymore now we're getting because jesus already <laughs> said this is god's word now we got to figure out how i got to be god's word yeah. all right god bless you all you're dismissed we'll see you next time and uh, we start class back the 2nd of January for the freshman, and that doesn't affect any of you. So uh, if you have any questions, give me a call. Uh, the master's, the bachelor's class starts the 4th of the January. The master's class that starts on the 5th will meet here. You will be here. You now know that. You'll be here on the 5th. I will be here on Thursday evening the 5th. Okay, Thursday evening the 5th, the master's will be here. That would apply to Nathan. Okay, we'll see you all next time. I Please be here next week. It starts picking up a lot more interest now.